We're going to start with Europe. Economic outlook there is beginning to brighten a bit more. Fresh data shows that the Eurozone notched its first quarter of growth since the recession that began at the end of 2011. Economic output for the region rose three-tenths of one percent in the second quarter. Germany was one of the main drivers. But the European Commission is warning against expecting a full recovery soon. Over in the UK, the unemployment rate there held steady at 7.8 percent for the last quarter. But that's still well below above the 7 percent target set last week by the Bank of England. The bank's governor, Mark Carney, says he'll keep interest rates at a record low until the target is reached. Richard Bestick reports on reaction from the British business community. Companies like Haywood Tyler here have welcomed the certainty given them by the Bank of England's dramatic break with tradition. The producer of pumps and motors for power stations and oil exploration around the world is investing this year one and a half million dollars, much of it through loans. So knowing the cost of cash is critical. Businesses plan um, years ahead. Uh, if we've got the knowledge that uh, interest rates will remain low for two, three years, we've got the opportunity then to look at our, uh, what we can afford, uh, and that all helps in terms of the certainty for, for the business. The problem with unemployment is that for the Bank of England, it's a moving target. There's slack in the economy. These people will need to borrow, and they need the confidence to borrow. What if the workers here simply do more overtime? That won't bring down the unemployment rate. Which could throw Bank of England estimates on when the economy is strong enough for an interest rate hike. Bank of England Governor Mark Carney says he wants to see unemployment fall from its current 7.8% to 7% before raising rates. Some analysts say that could happen as early as next year. Others, that it might not happen for another three years. Clarity, though, to encourage UK companies like Hayward Tyler to borrow, spend and increase productivity. Well, demand is up. Activity levels in our markets are high. Therefore, uh, we're recruiting people and the certainty that uh, the uh, Bank of England's um, announcement has made just helps the business. It means, of course, that for the first time in decades, unemployment has become mission-critical data and will be watched closely by businesses, banks and world markets. Richard Bestick, CCTV, London. Peter Schiff joins us live from Western Connecticut, CEO and Chief Global Strategist at Euro Pacific Capital. Good to see you, Peter. Let me start with these numbers out of Europe. What does it tell us about the overall economy in the UK? Well, you know, I think if the, if the goal is to create jobs, they're not going to do it by creating inflation. Holding interest rates uh, too low is not what's going to create jobs in the UK. They have to understand what is the, the impediment to job creation, and it's big government programs, it's minimum wage laws, it's other laws that restrict uh, employers' ability uh, with respect to hiring and firing and, the, and all the, the various taxes that they uh, encounter and lawsuits that they potentially encounter when they hire people. So that's what the government should be focused on, getting back, removing all these barriers to let the free market create jobs. But if they think they're going to create jobs by creating inflation and keeping interest rates low, they're wrong. Peter, you and I have had a, a lot of conversations about different problems around the world, but we've actually never talked about this specific one, and that's the, the youth unemployment, not necessarily just only in the U.K., but also the whole entire uh, rest of Europe. And look, they embrace capitalism. They, for the most part, have a, a free markets. What are they doing wrong, and why is this such a, just a crazy problem when you try to explain this to somebody who lives outside of Europe? Well, you know, the minimum wage law is particularly problematic for young, unskilled people. Now, I know the British, they have some kind of apprentice training rage, wage, but, you know, by the time you get to be 19, I think the full minimum wage applies, which, you know, I think it's close to, in U.S. terms, about $10 an hour. I'm not sure exactly what it is, uh, you know, in, in, in pounds, but that, that's about where it is. But, you know, a lot of people aren't worth that much. They don't have the skills, and, of course, the minimum wage is just the beginning. You know, you have to pay a lot of uh, taxes. Uh, on top of that, there's, there's payroll taxes. So the cost of hiring people is a lot higher than just the minimum wage payment. 
Uh, and so for a lot of people, that's a barrier they can't overcome. What, what about this, so what about this issue of um, permanent unemployment? What about this issue of firing people? Because I, I hear that a lot from a lot of economists, that oh, it's hard to fire people, it's hard to, to add headcount or eliminate headcount depending on your business. Is that a problem? Of, of course it's a problem. If, if businessmen know that if they hire somebody, it's going to be difficult to fire them, then they're going to be reluctant to hire them in the first place. You know, the easier it is to fire, the more likely it is you're going to hire. You know, a lot of times you hire people, you're taking a chance. You don't know if they're going to work out or not. Uh, maybe you want to get rid of them, but if that's going to be a problem, if you're going to have to pay a, a fee, if you're going to have to pay a lawyer in order to fire somebody, uh, you're not going to hire them. And you know, also in the UK, they have a very lucrative social welfare state. They make it very uh, enticing for people not to work, to live on the dole instead. So you've got that double whammy. You have the government making it hard to get a job. And then they make it very lucrative not to work. So when you take the two in combination, you create this situation of high unemployment. And to think that the central bank can do anything about that by just manipulating interest rates, the only thing they're going to do is make the situation worse. I was a little worried that uh, you might talk politics with me here, but I'm going to give you a shot at it. There's, there's a lot of criticism in the U.K. about this uh, immigration situation. And you hear that in different parts of the world, including here in the U.S., that if the immigration policy is that people can come from all over the world, that they're going to take my job, wherever that job might be, on the factory floor or in an office building, does that hold any merit in the UK? It doesn't hold any merit anywhere. You know, throughout history, people have always tried to scapegoat immigrants because they're usually an easy scapegoat because sometimes they don't look like the native population, they don't sound like them, and so they're easy to scapegoat. But, you know, nobody takes anybody's job because nobody is entitled to a job. A job is created by an employer who has a need that a, a worker may or may not be able to fill. But just because people come in and are willing to work, it doesn't take away any opportunities. It doesn't take away any jobs. It actually improves the situation because people working and helping the society to create new products, provide new services, makes everybody better. But yeah, it's very easy to say, oh, it's because of these uh, the immigrants that are coming in. You know, look at all the benefits. You know, there are a lot of jobs that are performed by immigrants. You take the immigrants out of the equation, and the jobs aren't performed at all. And people have to do without a lot of the services uh, that we take for granted. This is a discussion we could have over a cup of coffee. Are you saying that because the social welfare system, or maybe I put it in a different way, because of all the social benefits some of these countries have, we won't name particular ones, I'll let you do that, but that's basically making people so that, hey, you know what, I've got this great life, I can go do anything that I want to do, I get money from the government, why should I bother going to work? Is that what you're saying? Well, that happens a lot in the UK in particular, but it's not just the benefits you get for not working. But the minute you start to work, not only do you lose those benefits, but now you have to pay taxes. So the actual marginal tax rate for people who go off welfare or the dole, whatever they want to call it over there, and, get, and start working, that's some of the highest marginal tax rates that anybody faces. Uh, and so in many cases, it's, it's just too big an obstacle. People don't want to do it. And, and so they're going to they're gonna stay on, 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 on government support, and they're never going to get that first job. They're never going to climb up the job ladder to get to the point where they can make a lot of money uh, because they never take that low-paying job because of the enormous tax that they have to pay when it's a combination of a loss of a benefit and then having to pay a tax. And, of course, you know, working is a lot more difficult than not working. You have to wake up early in the morning. You have to be responsible. <laughs> All right, Peter, I, I, I better go to work myself, forth. too. Uh, you know, you wait. I, uh, <laughs> it's always good to talk to you. Uh, always fascinating to hear your opinion. Peter Schiff, CEO of your Pacific Capital. We'll see you here in Washington soon, hopefully. Thank you.